So topic six is about succession and change in ecosystems. Succession is simply a process where species replace other species. The ecosystem kind of evolves. It's a really long and slow process um, and there's two kinds of succession. There's primary succession begins with a bare environment um, examples rocks and eventually over hundreds and thousands of years you can get an environment that has trees in it. Secondary succession is an area that's already populated with organisms. Something happens, many of the organisms are destroyed, it could be a forest fire and it's a regrowth of all those organisms back into the environment. So here's an example of primary succession. It starts with some bare rocks and some organisms called lichen grow on the rocks and the lichen absorb moisture they get trapped on the rocks and moisture from the air lichens actually a symbiotic relationship between two species um, there's fungus and there's algae and they both benefit from the relationship the lichen grow they die they start to dissolve the rock, they create acids. Um, the rock dissolving and the dead lichen together start forming little bits of soil, start breaking the rock apart. And in these little bits of soil on the rock you can get things like mosses and ferns that start to grow, simple organisms growing. Um, they grow, they decay, they add their nutrients to the soil. The soil gets a little bit thicker and eventually grasses and weeds can start to grow. <laughs> Same thing with them. They keep adding to the thickness of the soil and the organic matter that's in the soil until we can have these large organisms like trees and shrubs begin to grow and other organisms are attracted to the area, animals and more plants and the ecosystem becomes very complex. Secondary succession is when we've already got an ecosystem that's established with lots of different organisms. We're going to take a forest for an example here. The, we'll say that there's a forest fire that occurs. The trees all burn. They leave some tree stumps behind. There's lots of ash in the soil. And the first organisms to come back in this situation are the grasses and the flowers, the weeds. And same thing occurs. They continue to grow, they enrich the soil, and then eventually we get our forest back. Now something interesting about forest fires that your textbook talks about are two types of pine tree, the jack pine and the lodgepole pine. They actually have cones that rely on forest fires. In order for the seeds to be released from the cones, the cones have to get hot enough and pop open and then they can release their seeds. So cones that need forest fires are referred to as serotonous cones. Kind of interesting. So we've talked about natural changes. Now we're going to talk about changes caused by humans. What happens when humans cause changes to the environment? Humans cause changes in many ways. Uh, just a few of them here. Forestry, we cut down forests, clear them out, don't leave much behind. Sometimes we replant. Um, agriculture, we clear land to plant, grow crops. Um, we build urban areas, lots of big cities, build highways and parking lots, another way that we cause physical changes to the environment. Now when we change the environment, we change the species that can actually survive in that environment. And that's a really important idea here because some species can adapt better than others. Um, an example here is the brown-headed cowbird. It adapts well to open spaces and it starts to push out the natural species that live in the area. Um, it lays its eggs in the nests of warblers and, and vireos and the baby brown-headed cowbirds um, are louder, they eat more, they grow faster, and they end up pushing out the chicks of the warblers and the varios out of the nests and they survive better 
<clears throat> so the warblers and the vireos can't survive in the environment as well. Another species that adapts pretty well to change versus some others is the coyote. The coyote's got a pretty close relative, the wolf, but you see coyotes in around urban areas a lot more than you do see wolves because they're better adapted to change. The wolves are more sensitive to the environmental changes and we don't see them around populated areas as much as we do coyotes, although they are quite similar animals. Another way that humans affect the environment is through pest control. We talked in topic two about DDT and its harmful effects to the peregrine falcon. Um, here we want to talk about a different type of pest. Um, this is the ligus bug. Now the ligus bug is an insect that feeds off of alfalfa and canola crops and it destroys these crops. Now we can control the ligus bug by spraying pesticides but pesticides we use to spray ligus bugs will also kill things like bees. Um, another thing the pesticides can do is they can actually harm the predators of the ligus bug themselves, other insects that eat the ligus bug. And without the predators around, then the ligus bug actually increases its population. So spraying to kill the ligus bug can actually increase the population of the ligus bug if you're also killing its predators at the same time. So what's a better way to control insects than just to spray pesticides all over the place? Uh, one method is called biological control. This is where we use um, natural enemies of the pest to control the pest. An example here is leafy spurge. This is a weed that was introduced. It's an exotic species and it grows really fast. It takes over pasture areas and unfortunately the cattle won't eat it. So it'll grow and grow and grow until the pasture land can't even be used anymore. So and an introduced species, we also call it an, an exotic species, is one that's not native to the area. It was accidentally introduced but it's continuing to grow and grow and it starts to take over whole entire areas. We control leafy spurge by introducing another species actually. Uh, there's a beetle that loves to eat leafy spurge and it kills leafy spurge. It's called the black dot spurge beetle. And in 1983 we introduced the black dot spurge beetle and it's successfully controlling leafy spurge in many areas. <clears throat> Now, when we, when we introduce new species, even if it's to do something like biological control and keep invasive species under control, there's always risks involved. Now, the main risk is that the introduced species could cause harm. There's many, many, many examples of this. So one example is the zebra mussel. It was introduced into the Great Lakes and there's no natural predator to the zebra mussel so it's slowly taking over the Great Lakes and replacing other natural species that are there. Another one is uh, European starlings. There's a picture of a flock of starlings. There's millions and millions and millions of starlings now that started with just a few starlings being released in Central Park in New York and they're all over North America. Another one is Scotch broom. It was introduced into BC with just a few seeds and it's taking over large areas of BC and pushing out natural species there as well. And purple loof strife. This is a plant that colonizes wetlands. It pushes out plants. When it pushes out the plants that are on the wetlands, it also pushes out the species that rely on those plants that are being replaced. So its effects are felt all over the ecosystem. And many people like to plant purple loosestrife in their gardens. It's a pretty purple flower. So with all these effects that we have on the ecosystems, we cause species to become endangered. We've all heard about species that have become extinct. Extinct just basically means that they no longer exist. A few examples of this from Canada are the great auk. Kind of looks like a penguin there. The Dawson's caribou, which is a woodland caribou no longer exists. 
the sea mink, which is larger than the normal American mink that we think of, and the blue walleye, which is extinct from the Great Lakes. Now the main reasons for extinctions, the biggest one is habitat loss, followed by introducing other species, overusing populations by overhunting or overfishing, um, polluting ecosystems, and also climate change is a big problem as well. Now when we talk about species at risk, there's a few other terms that would be good for you to know. Um, extirpated is not quite extinct. It means the animal's been removed from a certain part of their habitat and no longer found there, but they are found in other places. Um, endangered as well, that's one that you've all heard of, I'm sure. They're endangered of becoming extinct or extirpated. A threatened species is a species that we're worried about, but not as seriously as one that's endangered. Um, a lower risk is vulnerable, and, and a good category is recovering, species that are recovering, like the peregrine falcon and the swift fox in Alberta. So how can you help? What are some ways that you can help with these species at risk and environmental impacts? All, all the recovery programs depend on public's cooperation. When laws are made, when signs are posted, the public needs to obey them and, and realize that they're actually important in order to help animals that are at risk. An example of this is the burrowing owl. Its habitat needs to be protected. The landowners have to agree to protect the habitat because it's really all in their hands. If they don't protect the habitat, then there's no way that we can protect the burrowing owl. And another very important way that you can, you can help out is to reduce your own ecological footprint. The larger your ecological footprint, the more resources and the more land you are responsible for using up, or the more land is required to keep you happy in your habits and your wants and your needs. So, redu so reducing your ecological footprint is a great place to start. Well, in our next topic, we'll talk about uh, monitoring the environment and how scientists do that. Thanks for watching.